exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens.
great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations.
deeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Light in the darkness. Oh! 
blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honor and might forever. Amen. They will wage war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality and accepts no bribes. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. Our God, the firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, the nations rise and fall.
seated. Lord, on this Father's Day, we are so grateful, not only for our earthly fathers, we're grateful, Lord, for our Heavenly Father, a Father that loves us so much that you sent your one and only Son to die that we might live, that we might have a relationship with you, that we might put our full weight and trust in you. I pray, Lord, today that you would speak to us through your word. Help us to hear your voice. We pray for your anointing, and we ask all this in your wonderful name. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled is the title of this message. And we find the solution to a troubled heart in John chapter 14. And I have to ask you a question. What is it that troubles your heart? What is it that troubles your heart? It's, it's easy to make a long list of things that really trouble our heart. We, we think of family. We're always concerned about our family. We think of our friends. We're concerned for our friends. We think of our finances. We want to make sure that we're doing things right and orderly. We worry about the future. We worry about sickness or someone that we know that is struggling with a sickness. There are a long list of things that could easily trouble our heart. We can't help but look at the news and be troubled by what we see on the news at any given time. We're troubled by the fact that it seems like the media constantly is trying to divide us. Now, I don't know if it's true for you, but for me, I don't live in a divided world. The people I rub shoulders with, the people that are my neighbors and my friends are people that are, well, people that I care about. And they seem to care about me. I rarely see the conflicts that are so often shown on the media. And, and the media wants to divide us. And I don't understand all that, but it troubles my heart. What is it that troubles your heart? In John 14, 1, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's a young couple. They were just newly married, and they had a home. And you know how it is when you're setting up your house for the very first time. Everything is exciting. Every dish, uh, every color, paint color and, and choice that you make, there's that excitement of, of nesting of preparing that house. Uh, it's your home together. And, and this wife, she was no different than many wives, and she wanted to make sure that everything was good and perfect, and, and she just was excited about decorating and caring for the house. And, but she would go to bed at night, and she would often hear creaks in that old house that they were renting. And she would say to her husband, Honey, did you hear that? I think there's a robber in the house. And for her not to have a troubled heart, he'd get up and, and go walk through the house and come back and say, honey, go to, go to sleep. There's no one here. A couple weeks went by and she heard another creak, another moan in the house. And she elbowed her husband and said, honey, honey, did you hear that? Did you hear that? I think there's a robber in the house. And, and he got up and he loved his wife. And it, wasn't, it was important that she not be troubled. And so he walked through the house and made sure that nobody was there and, and there was nobody there and came back in and said, honey, there's nobody there. Go back to sleep. Well, this went on week after week and about three years into their marriage, he, she elbowed him and said, honey, honey, I think there's a robber in the house. And he dutifully got up. He's been doing this now for quite some time and he didn't want her to have a troubled heart. And so he walked through the house and sure enough, there was a robber. So he reached out his hand and shook his hand and said, my wife has been expecting you. <laughs> not, all, now, not all the things that give us a troubled heart are true. Have you noticed that? Sometimes our heart is troubled by things that never come about or never really happen. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. For the disciples, when Jesus spoke these words, their hearts were deeply troubled. 
You see, in a very short time, the world that they had become to know, the walking with Jesus, learning from Jesus, having Jesus by their side, all that was going to collapse before their eyes. Jesus, whom they had loved. Jesus, the one for whom they had forsaken all things, was leaving. Their beloved leader, whom they had loved more than life itself, whom they were willing to die for, was going away. The ramifications of all that Jesus had told them must have staggered their mind. You see, beginning in John chapter 12, he begins to tell them that I'm going to die and I'll no longer be with you. So undoubtedly, in John 14, when Jesus said to the disciples, let not your heart be troubled, their minds were full of trouble. They were bewildered, perplexed, confused, and filled with all kind of anxiety. And so the first six verses of John chapter 14, we find Jesus comforting his disciples, even though he knew that in a few hours he would go and pray in that garden. And in that prayer of anguish, he would sweat drops of blood, the scripture says. He would be betrayed. He would be beaten and flogged. He would be crucified and mocked. He would bear the sins of mankind as he died on the cross. He knew all this was about to happen. And any other man would have thought of no one but himself facing this. And yet Jesus thought of his disciples. And he thought of you. And he says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You see, Jesus anticipated their sorrow. He anticipated their breaking hearts. And he gives them comfort. And he gives to each of us comfort. The original Greek literally means stop letting your heart be troubled. So Jesus literally is saying, stop it. I got this. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And so he says to the disciples, stop it. But it was hard for the disciples not to be worried. In fact, they were terrified. They were fully convinced that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. They proclaimed so. They accepted the fact that this Messiah would become, well, they thought an earthly king an illustrious king, a superhero, if you were, will. They saw Jesus as a sovereign ruling king, a king who would rule in love. Their hopes had risen even higher just a week before when Jesus rode in Jerusalem on a donkey. When they waved palm, palm branches and shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and worshiped him. The disciples began to argue amongst themselves who would sit on his right and who would sit on his left. And yet Jesus began talking about dying in John chapter 12, verse 23. How could they reconcile this Jesus, the Messiah, was going to die? What good is a dead ruler or a dead king? What would happen to them? If you're not here, what happens to us? We had forsaken all things to follow you in their messianic dreams, expectations of sitting at his right and his right left hand were all dashed in a moment. What good was the Messiah who was going to die? In addition, he, Jesus informed them that the Lord himself would be betrayed by one of them in the upper room. And there in that upper room dialogue, Jesus said that Peter you'll betray me three times before the rooster crows. The strongest among them would deny Christ three times, the one who they called the rock. So the disciples were undoubtedly be bewildered, 
perplexed, confused, and filled with all kinds of anxiety. And their hearts were deeply troubled. What is it that troubles your heart? Again, Jesus says, do not let your heart be, be troubled. He says to us, stop letting your heart be troubled. And he was saying to the disciples on that day, stop letting your heart be troubled. You see, let not implies a choice. We can make a decision with our intellect and our will to stop letting our hearts be troubled. To trust the Lord with our troubled heart. Far too often, I'm afraid, instead of trusting the Lord with our troubled heart, we, we try to fix things ourselves. Instead of going first to the Savior with the trouble and to cast all of our cares on him or to lay them at his feet, we, we take it on ourselves. I got this. I got this, Jesus. And we take the burdens on ourselves. Last Saturday, I was uh, d just responsible for a funeral. And that's one of the many things I do around here is I do a lot of funerals. And we had a funeral dinner that day, and I wasn't actually preaching. It was uh, uh, Brian Miller was preaching the message. It was Edith uh, uh, Gott, Gott Miller's, uh, Gott, Gottman's, Gotterman's, Gotterman's uh, husband's funeral, Greg Gotterman's funeral. And I was worried about all the details. Uh, just make sure everything was organized, the bulletin was together, working with the funeral home, and you know, all the details that happened behind the scenes with the funeral. We had a lunch that day and wanted to make sure everything was set up for that. And, and I was running around, getting everything in place, make sure everything was organized and, and everything was running properly. And, and I noticed the foyer seemed a little bit warm. And I went and looked at the thermostat. It said it was 72 degrees, so I kind of pushed the button to knock the temperature down because I was getting really kind of warm myself. And it didn't seem to cool down. I went over there, it was still 72 degrees. And, and uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll go upstairs and make sure the power's on and check the power light. It was on. And then I opened up the furnace itself that controlled the air conditioning unit there and, and checked it. And I saw this uh, corroded, really corroded ground wire. I said, well, that's got to be the problem. And so I went out and got my drill and, uh, and I put a wire brush on the grill, drill and I, you know, I worked on that ground wire and it still wasn't running properly. And what's going on here? And so I, I grabbed a meter to go check the fuses and I checked to make sure the fuses were working and they both beep, 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 they all three worked. And so I, I didn't know what else to do. And then I ground that down, but I couldn't get the screw out and, and went back down. It was still 72 degrees and, and I was, by this time I was dripping wet. I mean, I had a white t-shirt, a white shirt, dress shirt on, and I had a black suit coat on, over top of that. I took the suit coat off, and you can just see right through the shirt. I thought, well, I guess I can't take my coat off. And I could actually see sweat coming through the back of my coat, and I, I was drenched. Well, I finished, you know, the service, and we had the meal, and we put all the tables and chairs away, got everything ready for Sunday school the next day, and uh, went home. When I got home, I realized I didn't clean up my tools, I didn't finish fixing the ground wire, and I still needed to solve the problem, so I came back to the church, and, and I got the ground wire loose, got it all cleaned up, got it connected back together, and it still didn't work. Sunday rolls around, and I thought about calling Kirk Zimmerman, having coming out, but I thought, you know, it's only 72 degrees, we'll be okay, we'll make it through tomorrow, and I'll, I'll wait till Monday to call him. Sunday rolls around, and Roy's there and I'm talking to Roy and if, if, uh, if I don't have the answer, Roy does. Roy's our answer guy. He knows more about this building than I do and, and I always go to Roy and so I'm asking, telling him what happened and you know, what he thinks and, and he's looking at the thermostat and he said, it's not switched to cool. <laughs> and what's so embarrassing about that is the very first question I ask everybody when they say the heat's not on I ask, is it switched to heat? When the kitty prep school calls me up and says, the air conditioning is not working in room seven, the very first question I ask, is it switched to cool? You see, I didn't even bother to go to the source. 
I just began to fix the problem. And how often, how often are we like Martha, just trying to fix the problem instead of laying it to Jesus' feet? You see, we really ought to go to the stores. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is the source for helping us with our troubled heart. You see, we live with conflict, disappointment, and pain. We all experience hours of deep tragedy and times of trial. But he is with us even in the trial. Whatever your trouble, whatever your mess you're in, whatever anxiety or perplexity you have, just remember the Lord is here. And he speaks to us and he says, let not your heart be troubled. And with that, let not is a choice to give it to the Lord. The Bible says, resist the devil at its onset, 1 Peter 5.8. You see, the longer you put up with something, a troubled heart, the harder it is to get rid of it. I put up with that and sweated through my jacket instead of just going to the stores. And so often, we try to fix it. The Bible says, resist the devil at its onset. Guard your heart. Don't allow a troubled heart to keep you from the purpose of God in your life. And so Jesus says to the disciples and to us who are worried about our futures, who have troubled hearts, he says, stop it. Do not let your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In the Bible, the heart is described as the center of our emotions. The Bible talks about the heart in many different ways talks about a failing heart, a foolish heart, a willing heart, a proud heart, a wise heart, a pure heart, a discouraged heart, a set heart, a fearful heart, a rebellious heart, an understanding heart, a new heart, a broken heart, a sound heart, a clean heart, a heavy heart. You see, the heart is important. It's what is in your heart that counts. You see, you rarely stop a man or a woman from lying, cheating, or stealing by punishment or incarceration or even in some cultures cutting off their hands. If it's in his heart to steal, he will steal. If you want to change a man, you change his heart. It's a heart condition. In youth ministry, I I learned that... uh, It was best to discipline from the arena of respect. I respect you. I care about you. I love you. I want the best for you. I see in you what you do not see in yourself. And that arena of respect created for me an environment where students respected me. I gave them respect, and I expected in return respect. Well, when I went to the Springdale Church of the Nazarene, um, it was a very large church, a beautiful facility, and they had a junior high pastor and a senior high pastor, and they hired me to be both. The junior high pastor did a different job, the senior high pastor did a different job in the church, and now I was the pastor of both junior high and senior highers in this larger church. And we had many discipline problems. And I was trying to help them to come to grips with, you know, I don't, it's no fun for me as your youth pastor just to be your cop, to constantly be saying, you can't do this, you can't do that, no, no, don't do that, don't run, don't stop, you know, all those things. And it wasn't any fun for me just constantly disciplining the students. Well, one Wednesday night, I was teaching a Bible study, and uh, I had planned ahead of time. There was a family in the church. They had three, three kids. Zach was the youngest. He was an eighth grader. Rachel was in 10th grade, and Matt was a senior in high school. And we all had the junior high and the senior high together. I was teaching a Bible study. 
It was a Wednesday night. There were about 80 kids there. And it was in a, our former worship center, which is now a gym with a, with a wood floor. So the noise issue was an issue. And um, I'm teaching on a Wednesday night. And, and every week, you know, there would be a one or two, three, four kids back in the back just talking. And I would try to teach a lesson, and the kids were talking. And so I talked to Zach ahead of time. I said, Zach, uh, I need your help tonight. And uh, he said, okay, what do you need? And I said, well, Zach, tonight I want you to talk just like you normally do. <laughs> and so uh, then I'm going to interrupt you, and I'm going to ask you nicely. I said, Zach, will you be quiet? And uh, then I want you to start talking again. And then I'm going to stop again. I said, Zach, would you please be quiet? And then I want you to start talking again. And then I'm going to walk closer to you. Get right up to you. Proximity. Zach, I asked you, would you be quiet? And then, Zach, I want you to keep talking. And then I'm going to come over, and he had a leather jacket on that night... I'm going to come over, I'm going to pick you up out of your chair and hold you up as high as I physically can. And I'm going to slam you down into the chair. And I'm going to say, Zach, shut up and sit down. He said, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> so Wednesday night came around, and, and I'm teaching the lesson, and Zach's all cued in. Nobody else knows what's going on. And uh, Zach begins, begins to talk. I said, Zach, would you... Would you please be quiet? And uh, he started to talk, and, and I said, Zach, please, please, would you be quiet? And he continued to talk, and I, and I got real close to him. Zach, well, by this time, his sister Rachel said, Zach, shut up. Will you shut up? <laughs> <laughs> and he keeps talking. Can you believe the kid kept talking? And I go over to him, and I lift him up as high as I could, and I shoved him down into his chair. I said, Zach, would you shut up? And I could see Matt over here. He was standing up, ready to defend his brother. And I said, Matt, just stand right there. What Zach and I know, you don't know. Zach was a part of this all along, and the whole youth group goes, oh, man! <laughs> you see, it's a heart issue. And that night I talked to them about their heart. That I can make you sit down. I can put rules in place that make you behave. But if you're not willing to have a change of heart, it's all for naught. I don't want to be your youth pastor in a place where I'm constantly having to call you down. I want to love on you and care for you and teach you and instruct you, but I can't do that without your help. You see, it's a heart issue. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. One of the reasons we have a troubled heart is because we hold on to things instead of giving it to the Lord. One of the reasons we have a troubled heart is because we think we can fix it one of the reasons we have a troubled heart is because we don't acknowledge the resource that is ours in Christ Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. You see, the disciples, they were bewildered, perplexed, confused, filled with all kinds of anxiety, and their hearts were deeply troubled. And Jesus says, stop. Just stop it. Let's look at verse 2. Jesus says, in my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. Peter, James, John. Speaking to all the eleven that are there. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. He speaks to us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. So the solution to a troubled heart is to trust God. But it's also to see the big picture. God's got this. He's already prepared a place for us. 
Billy Graham said it this way, I've read the last book of the chapter and we win. It's seeing the big picture. It's understanding whose we are in Christ Jesus. That we were bought at a price. That he is enough. You see, the truth is, life is not always easy. But we can trust the Savior. And he has prepared a place for us. The disciples themselves, all of which who uh, fled during the crucifixion, except for John. John, the beloved, was the one who observed. All the rest fled. These same disciples who were, feared, who were fearful for their own lives, when empowered by the Holy Spirit, would begin to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Even to the point of death. You see, for their testimony, they were tortured and flogged and finally all but John faced death by the sword or an arrow or by hanging. See, Peter was crucified. Andrew was crucified. Matthew died by the sword. John, by natural death after being banished to the island of Patmos. James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified. Philip was crucified. Simon was crucified. Thaddeus was killed by an arrow. James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned. Thomas was killed by a spear thrust through him, and Bartholomew was crucified. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed by a sword. From the very beginning, they have tried to stamp out this good news of Jesus Christ, and yet his word will not be stopped. His word is the same yesterday, day, and forever. And the word of God speaks today, and he says, let not your heart Be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. He has prepared a place for you and for me. November 22nd, I preached a sermon about um, marriage and betrothal and how it worked in a Jewish family. And it's a part of this message today. You see, marriages were prearranged by the father. The father and often his wife would look around the village and they would find a, a, a suitable bride for their son. Someone that they felt like would be a good fit for the family. It was important that it was a good fit for the family because the bride would move into the father's house. And so they would choose. It was an arrangement. And then they would go to the son and they would say to the son... What do you think? What do you think of Mary? Oh, Mary's a good choice. And the son agreed, then the two fathers would get together and they would begin to negotiate a price. They called it a, a bride price. It was a mohar. And once this mohar was agreed upon, this bride price was agreed upon, then they would draw up a legal contract. It was the ketubah. Once this ketubah was agreed upon, then the future groom would go to the bride's house and he would knock on the door. If she opened the door, that was the beginning of the invitation, of accepting that. Of course, she already knew because the two fathers had gotten together and, and talked about it. They had set a bride price. They would set a legal contract. And now all that was needed was the cup of acceptance. So the groom would go into the house and he would pour a glass of wine. And he would offer it to the bride, and if she, drunk, if she took a drink from that cup, she was accepting his proposal. After that, he would leave the house, and he would go to his father's house, and he would prepare a room for them on the father's house. And so when we read this scripture, we see this Jewish tradition in my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with, with me, that you may also be where I am. So Jesus has prepared a place for those of us who are believers. He's paid the price, the bride price. He died on the cross for you and for me. There's this contract it's the new covenant. 
And he offers to us the opportunity for salvation. It's ours to accept or reject. You see, with this salvation, not only comes the promise of eternity, but peace in the midst of the storms of life. That's what, let not your heart be troubled, I got this. With this cup of salvation is a new life, fresh start. The old is gone, the new has come. There's the renewing of the mind. It's taking what we messed up and using our, heart, our heartaches and our hurts and our brokenness for his glory. You see, our God loves us, and he offers to us this cup of acceptance. Have you accepted the cup of acceptance? Have you asked Jesus into your heart and life? Finally, verse 4, 5, and 6. You know the way to the place where I'm going, and Thomas said to him, Lord, Lord, we do not know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus says to you today, let not your heart be troubled. Edgar's going to come and we're going to sing, I forget the song, Change My Heart, O God. And it may be like me. Too often you're like Martha in the Bible, just busy doing the work. Too often I'm busy doing the work of the church. And you get so focused on what is next that you you forget to go to the source. And you need to change a heart. Oh, you're a follower of Christ, you walk with Christ, but you have a troubled heart. And the trouble is, your eyes not fixed on Jesus, the author. Your eyes are fixed on all that's around you and you're trying to do it. In your own strength. You forgot that Jesus is our yoke mate. And you don't have to carry this burden alone. Change my heart, oh God. Make it ever new. It may be that you've never asked Jesus Christ in your heart and life, and you have a troubled heart, and you don't know the peace of God. You don't know the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God is not this, there's no light there for you. Today is the day of salvation. Would you accept the cup of acceptance and ask Him in your heart and life? Let's sing that song together. Let's stand. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be Let's pray together. Lord, in just a moment, we're going to receive our tithes, our offerings, and our faith, promise, gifts, for mission. Lord, you bless us in so many ways, and we want to be a blessing to our world. 
we want to put you first in all things. But today, as we've listened to your word, we've been challenged to let not our hearts be troubled, but to trust in you. Help us, Lord, to go from this place with our full weight of our burdens, our cares. Help us to cast them on you. Help us, Lord, as we go from this place, not to try to solve everything, but to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and trust you for everything. Seek your wisdom and your direction. To examine your word and Allow your Holy Spirit to be our guide. Help us to live in such a way, Lord, that we're a clear reflection of your love and your glory. Thank you, Lord, for loving us so much that you died so that we might live and that we might have eternity with you. We rest in your peace today, and I pray for your peace upon those in this service. And we pray all this in your wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.